Thanks for joining us. Just a few hours to go now for India's second mission to the moon. And this for ISRO has, they've begun their launch countdown. Chandrayaan-2 is scheduled to be launched at 2.43 p.m. today. The mission's aim is to improve the understanding of the moon and explore uncharted territory of our natural satellite. Now, as the eyes of not just the country, but across the world are on this launch, let's welcome a very special guest, Anita Sengupta. She's an aerospace engineer and professor of astronautics at the University of Southern California, who joins us live now on the show. Thanks so much for joining us. It's uh, lovely to have you. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let's, let's begin by talking about the significance of this launch, because, uh, you know, as we've been saying, uh, not an overstatement at all, that it's not just India that's watching uh, this launch very closely, but uh, airspace scientists like yourselves across the globe who are uh, watching how ISRO is going to pull this off. Absolutely. I mean, it's historic for so many reasons, obviously, because of the anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission and because being able to send something to the surface of another planet is one of the greatest engineering feats that a space program and a country can do. In, in terms of what people learn from this, uh, you know, it's being described as uncharted territory on the, uh, on the moon that uh, ISRO is aiming for. In terms of past missions, uh, like the Apollo mission, uh, what is the difference this time? What will we learn, do you think, from this, uh, from this trip? So there are two different elements to developing a space mission of this complexity, and there are two different benefits. One is clearly from the scientific side. Uh, we're going to explore a place close to the southern pole of the moon, which has not yet been explored, which means that there'll be new scientific data, there'll be new surface science, there'll be new subsurface science, which should lend itself to future human um, you know, colonies that might get set up on the surface. And then for me, as an engineer, the most important one is the development of the technology and the engineering expertise to be able to do something of this complexity, which couples uh, really nicely to to human space exploration for Israel coming down the road. So, a lot of interesting things happening uh, in the world of space. Uh, the space race is getting hotter. But in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of ISRO and what they've been able to achieve, uh, you know, with a smaller budget, uh, you know, and aircraft that don't actually cost as much, perhaps, you know, way, way lesser, which ends up, uh, you know, working to their advantage. What do you think has been the key to the success of ISRO uh, over the last few years? We've seen, you know, this great strides made by them over the last, uh, last perhaps, decade or so. Absolutely. And there's so many dimensions to uh, the nature of the success. One, of course, is the utilization of Indian launch vehicle capability. The cost to orbit per pound or per kilogram is key to being able to reduce the cost of sending anything into space, whether you're going to low Earth orbit, you know, geostationary orbit, the moon or even Mars. So that's actually key uh, to the cost efficiency. India also has a really uh, well-educated engineering-based um, population. So I think that expertise that exists in the engineering disciplines couples all so nicely to the space program. So to be able to do something um, of this complexity on such a small budget um, really shows that something like future human exploration is attainable. You know, in many ways, we've seen, uh, you know, space exploration, uh, you know, put out of the grasp of many nations across the globe purely because it's just too expensive. Uh, but we've, you know, managed to find a way uh, ISRO has been able to find a way to do that. Uh, and we've also seen other countries, you know, sending up their satellites whenever there's a launch uh, of Israel. So, you know, there's also something to be said of making the program and uh, the system viable for the future. It really does. And I think uh, when you do something like this, you gain additional knowledge each time. And so that means that the next time around, it'll be even more cost effective, more time effective the next time around. And I think it also couples well to future international collaboration. So I think only recently over the past two weeks or so, the US space program has said that sending people to the moon and Mars is going to be an international endeavor. So the fact that India is able to do something of this complexity uh, by sending something to land on the surface of another planet, clearly India is going to be a major player in that future international collaboration in my opinion. Okay, now you were instrumental in, uh, you know, developing the revolutionary uh, parachute, supersonic parachute system on, uh, on the curiosity that, uh, you know, that created history in so many ways. You know, the challenge of that last mile, you know, landing the rover, landing the system on the, on the surface of the moon, you know what it's like and how difficult it is. Uh, you know, just want to quickly get your thoughts on, you know, what you think perhaps that last mile is going to be, because uh, it's all the anticipation of, uh, of, the, of the vehicle taking off from Earth, but it's that final mile that's going to have scientists with real butterflies in their stomach. 
Yeah, and, and that portion of um, sort of the discipline of space engineering is entry, descent, and landing engineering. And so it requires such great knowledge of what you're doing from a fundamental physics perspective because the timelines are so short. Everything has to work perfectly, and it has to work perfectly the first time, or it doesn't work. So that's the reason why you have to understand everything from a mass properties distribution, from a, in the case of Mars, atmospheric properties, and in the case of landing on the moon where there is no atmosphere, you have to understand how that trajectory is going to happen over a really short period of time and make sure that your guidance, navigation, control, and propulsion system performs at maximum efficiency. Okay, so many interesting things to look forward to. Uh, Ms. Sengupta, we'd also, you know, love to hear your thoughts on what you've made of, you know, ISRO's program so far. Uh, because, you know, it's different from NASA. NASA has its own uh, private budget, and, you know, in, in the past, ISRO may not have necessarily been uh, funded so well. Uh, that is changing over the years. But in terms of what, they, what they've been able to do with the resources that they have, uh, because India's always had the expertise. It's always had the brains behind uh, all the science. Uh, what do you think has made the difference? I think that there has been an emphasis uh, which has been put out from a political perspective, from a government perspective, to say that we want to do this, we want to invest in the space program, we want to send things to other planets and eventually send people to other planets. So I think it's that sort of political will, that sort of societal will, that this is something which is important for us as a society. I think that's kind of the difference here. And certainly, financial limitations for the space program are a problem across the globe. It's the same thing here in the United States, where I live and work, it's the same thing in Europe, it's the same thing in, in China and Japan. There's always going to be a financial limitation. So the way you overcome that, actually, is to make sure that you get the public's interest and involvement, and you also try and find a business case for space. So what I'd love to see happen in India next is sort of the commercialization of the space sector. So a combination of government support from ISRO, as well as the private industry coming in and saying, we want to go to space for business reasons. Okay, I just want to, you know, get a sense of, you know, what it's going to be like uh, at Sri Harikota, at the ISRO headquarters, as they prepare for launch, because, uh, you know, you're someone who who's known what it's like to be there in those tense moments when you've got your fingers crossed, your toes crossed, every, every uh, appendage possible is crossed, hoping that everything works out because uh, such are the uncertainties of space. Uh, what is that moment like when, uh, when you, you know it's the final leg of the mission and uh, if this doesn't work, it could all go very wrong? It's true. And we're still several months away, of course, from um, being able to do lunar operations because first we have to go through launch. But even today, during the launch of the spacecraft, they're going to be checking on the health of the spacecraft and they're also checking on the health of the launch field to make sure that it's safe to be able to send it off. But the good news is that when you plan for one of these missions, you do a lot of operational readiness tests, they're called, so that you know how to you know, conduct all the different steps in an on-nominal scenario and an off-nominal scenario. And you're constantly checking the telemetry, you're constantly checking the data, and then you will basically conduct the next step on your checklist. So things are very well planned out and therefore executed in that way. But certainly people are going to have butterflies in their stomach and they're going to be nervous because there's a lot riding on this launch. So much riding on it. And of course, uh, you know, the fact that they had to uh, put off the first launch because of a technical glitch tells you how things can be so, so uncertain in this uh, world of exploration. Let's, you know, I just want to ask you about what this uh, sort of means in uh, the world's quest for space exploration. The moon is a place that, uh, that humans have been to before, uh, that we've been able to explore in, in some ways. If you want to put in perspective what we learn, uh, what we could learn from this mission to the moon, what would that be? So in the context of the Indian Space Agency, of the technology development um, from a telecommunications, from a guidance navigation control, from a perspective of mission design, all of that is new and is key to being able to send people to the surface of the planet. Uh, that also couples really nicely to being able to go, I guess, not surface of the planet, but the surface of the moon. That couples really <laughs> nicely to eventually being able to send people to the surface of Mars, uh, because a lot of those technologies, there's a lot of overlap and there's a lot of development that has to be done. Uh, and so by developing those capabilities in-house, like literally the machinery, the, the analytical tools, the computational fluid dynamics tools, for the case of going to Mars, um, being able to build these engines, that couples really well to future human space exploration, both on Moon as well as on Mars. I, in a week, every time the Moon's mentioned, the lunar mission is mentioned, uh, the question that perhaps uh, people like you and a lot, lot of others get asked is, uh, do we see a day in the near or distant future where we perhaps, where we as a as a race begin to colonize uh, the moon? Is that is that as fanciful as a, a theory as is being made out to be? 
So I think it's very reasonable and very practical and certainly can be done because it was done before 50 years ago during the Apollo uh, missions. And that was done at a time where technology wasn't as advanced as it is today from a computational perspective, telecommunications perspective. So clearly it can be done again. I think the big challenge, of course, is the cost. If you're going to have a permanent human presence on the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars, there's a lot of infrastructure that has to be put in place in space from a you know on-orbit assembly scenario, from a mining scenario, from a tele telecommunications scenario from the, all the consumables that human beings need in terms of oxygen and food and water. Um, so there has to be a political will. There has to be a sort of a human drive to want to continue what I believe in, is in our DNA, which is exploration. But I do see that happening as long as we can also intersect with the private sector to bring in private capital, because we can show that there's a business case for existing, living and working in space. We're certainly some ways away from that, but it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, that's Professor Anita Sengupta, who's joining us from the U.S., who's an aerospace engineer and professor of astronautics at the University of Southern California. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and we look forward to uh, joining uh, for you joining us, perhaps after the launch. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Good luck, and thank you.